Let's travel back in Beatles history. Before the 50th anniversary releases of Abbey Road, The White Album, or Sgt. Pepper, there was first recordings, a 50th anniversary of, you guessed it, The Beatles' first recordings. On July 20th, 1961, the Liverpool, England entertainment paper, Mercy Beat, announced that a popular group of local lads had signed a recording contract and made their first recordings. These recordings, produced by Bert Camford for Germany's Polydor Records, would soon be overshadowed by all the Beatles would accomplish recording at EMI. But this hasn't stopped countless reissues of those first recordings. I have no less than a dozen reissues of the Polydor Sessions recordings in my collection including a Bear Family Records all-out box set edition. And this collection is by no means complete. Do you have a title in your collection that includes these early recordings of the not-so-savage young Beatles? Let me know in the comments. This video will focus on the Time Life Universal Music release that was issued in 2011 for the 50th anniversary of the Beatles' first recordings with Tony Sheridan. More accurately, these are mostly Tony Sheridan's first recordings with the Beat Brothers. More on that later. My channel has really been gathering a fantastic flock of fab followers. If you're new here, consider subscribing and click that bell icon to receive notifications of new content so you won't miss a single upload. Released on November 8th, 2011, this is The Beatles with Tony Sheridan. First recordings, 50th anniversary edition. This collection culls together all of the existing recordings that John, Paul, George, and Pete Best recorded while providing vocals and backing music for competent performer and Elvis wannabe, Tony Sheridan, in addition to two recordings of their own. I like the clever design here with the one in place of the I and the word first. Reminds me of another numbered release. This collection came contained in a slipcase. Inside was a sturdy bifold disc housing containing two CDs. Disc 1 featured all original mono versions of the Camford Sessions, while Disc 2 featured all original stereo versions. Bert Camford was more than proficient as a producer and these recordings are uniformly excellent. Technically speaking, there are no better recordings of the Beatles before they were the Beatles. Also included within the slipcase was this 36 page booklet with liner notes by Hans Olaf Gottfriedson. That's a solid name. All kidding aside, old Hans scored a Grammy nomination for best album notes losing out to the album notes for the Ray Charles release, Singular Genius, The Complete Singles. Ironically written by Billy Vera, best known for his work with Billy Vera and the Beaters. I wonder what Billy is doing at this moment. Let's take a closer look at what was included within this booklet. A ubiquitous take on a Sgt. Pepper reference is a solid way of getting started. Nice job, Hans, old buddy. Hans Olaf Gottfriedson. The liner notes go into the history of how these recordings came to be. We are guided through a timeline of the Beatles' early days, starting with the lineup of John, Paul, George, Stu Sutcliffe, and Pete Best. We learn how the boys embarked on their first stay in Hamburg, perfecting their craft, performing long hours in clubs within Hamburg's red light district. I mean, this is the Beatles! That must have been great, huh? Not so much. The boys didn't get along so well with the manager of the clubs they were playing, and he would shout at them, PUNISH -o! Apparently, he wasn't too impressed. George being underage at the time, and some good-natured arson on behalf of Paul and Pete also created problems with local authorities. I get the whole underage and the red light district argument, but who's the cotton-headed ninny muggins who gave Paul a hard time about some fun, old-fashioned arson? It's not like the guy's a pyromaniac or anything. Anyway, the notes go on to explain how during their initial trip to Hamburg, 
The Beatles met rocker Tony Sheridan. When the Beatles returned to Hamburg in April 1961, Stu had left the group to study fine arts and had shacked up with German art student and photographer Astrid Kircher, whose photographs appear in this booklet. Unfortunately, individual photo credits are not distinguished. One stark photo that really caught my eye is this shot, with the Beatles looking more like a group out of the 1970s punk scene than the early 60s. Imagine Johnny Rotten, Paul, George, and Ringo. Weird. With the exit of Stu, Paul took over playing bass for the group. The remaining four Beatles, John, Paul, George, and Pete, went on to play a 14-week engagement at the Top 10 Club, where they teamed up with Tony Sheridan. It was during this time that Burt Camford paid the Top 10 Club a visit and asked the boys if they wanted to record for Polydor. They were set up with a recording contract, and after having signed, each member of the Beatles wrote out a one-page biography, featured in their own hand in this booklet. And that's exciting to see. The notes continue with the recording sessions, which took place at a small orchestra hall known as Friedrich Ebert Hall over two days in June 1961. Two microphones were placed on stage and portable recording equipment was set up by Carl Heinz and his assistant. The recording was made live to stereo on a two-track tape recorder and the mixing was done on site with no overdubs. The star of these sessions was Tony Sheridan and Camfort wasn't much interested in the Beatles as a separate entity. Sheridan, with the Beatles, referred to at this time as the Beat Bros, recorded five songs over those two days. Those recordings were My Bonnie, The Saints, Why, If You Love Me Baby, Take Out Some Insurance On Me Baby, and Nobody's Child. In addition, the Beatles, without Sheridan, recorded a cover of the song Ain't She Sweet with a pretty sweet Lennon vocal and an instrumental titled Cry For A Shadow, credited to Harrison Lennon. These two tracks, along with My Bonnie, appeared on the Beatles Anthology 1 in 1995. Fun fact, the cover of Anthology 1 features the Beatles in their Hamburg lineup of John, George, Paul, and Pete Best. But Pete Best's head is gone, as if he's Marty McFly's sibling after a <clears throat> bird-watching incident. What, Lori? What? Where Pete's head should be, Ringo's head from the cover of Please Please Me can be seen underneath. That's pretty low, mister. In 2008, Pete Best referenced this on the cover of his album with the Pete Best band, Heyman's Green, which featured his missing head from the photo in the center of the Beatles Anthology 1. Touché, Pete Best. Now back to the Beatles with Tony Sheridan. Confusingly, Sheridan would go on to record with other backing groups referred to as the Beat Brothers, just as John Lennon would later do with his Plastic Ono band. For this reason, oftentimes songs that do not feature the Beatles are included with reissues of Tony Sheridan with the Beatles. The early tapes of the Beatles is one such example. Don't be fooled. The only recordings that exist of the Beatles from these sessions are the seven previously mentioned recordings, plus one additional recording I'll cover in a moment. There are variations on most of these songs, but still, there are only eight songs from the Polydor recordings. The notes contrast the failure of the first trip to Hamburg with the great success of the second trip. The Beatles returned to England with tales of their triumphs and were written about in the Mersey Beat fanzine. A story well known to many Beatles fans, but included in the notes and worth repeating, is that before Brian Epstein became the Beatles manager, a young man came into his record store and asked for the Camford recording of Sheridan and the Beatles, My Bonnie, Back to the Saints which had been released as a single. While it may not be likely this was the first time Epstein had heard of the Beatles, the encounter certainly piqued his interest in the group and set the stage for a visit to the Cavern Club to check out the group for himself. Also mentioned in the notes is the infamous Decca audition from January 1st, 1962. As the Beatles were being rejected by record companies, which was the case with Decca, Camfer allowed the contract between he and the Beatles to be terminated without so much as a counteroffer. According to the notes, Campert would go on to say, It was obvious to me that they were enormously talented, but nobody, including the boys themselves, knew how to use that talent or where it would lead them. Where it would lead them indeed. Sorry, Bert. 
Another early historical Beatle event is also covered in the liner notes. Turning down an additional stint at the Top 10 Club, the Beatles managed to set up a better arrangement at a new Hamburg night spot, the Star Club. Poor quality recordings of performances from the Star Club have surfaced frequently over the years. Leading up to the Star Club dates, it was a dark time for the group. The Beatles had been rejected by record companies, their contract with Polydor was dissolving, and sadly, their friend and former bandmate, Stu Sutcliffe, had died of a brain hemorrhage at only 21 years of age. The Beatles played the opening of the Star Club in April 1962, and Brian Epstein met with Bert Camphor to discuss a final recording session with Camphor for Sheridan before the Beatles were released from Polydor to take place in May 1962. A recording of Swanee River featuring the Beatles was recorded at this session, but has unfortunately been lost to history. A recording of Sweet Georgia Brown featuring the Beatles still exists from this session. That completes the titles featuring the Beatles, just eight recordings at the core of the Camford sessions. The notes go on to chronicle the ousting of Pete Best in favor of Ringo, the Beatles' first recordings with Parlophone, and their final shows at the Star Club at the end of 1962. The notes then detail a second wave of Sheridan releases following the Beatles' early success and an overdubbed version of Sweet Georgia Brown, with lyrics changed to mention the Beatles and their mop tops. In Liverpool, she even dared to criticize the Beatles' hair with their whole fan club standing there. Meet my Sweet Georgia Brown. North American releases are also mentioned, and the notes end with a nod to the fact that the recordings featured are among the most released and re-released recordings in the world. While these recordings may not be of interest to the casual fan, and even the hardcore fans may feel that they leave a lot to be desired, I think the notes actually sum up these recordings as being the Beatles in the state of becoming. This release, these recordings, and the well-researched and written notes really do tell the story of the Beatles before they were what they were to become. It's unfortunate the Grammy win was not to be for the album notes, and this release is to the best of my knowledge now out of print. But it really is a highlight of releases focused on these recordings. Thanks for watching, and be sure to beat that like button, Beatles fan. See you next time.